paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Welcome, everyone, to the Nick Bryant Podcast. Today, my guest is Bobby Capucci. How are you doing today, Bobby? Nick, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, you know, Nick, I am pretty much unlike most of the people that populate this space. This is all by accident for me. I never really planned on following this story. I never even planned on having a podcast. I was sitting around one day in my backyard with my dad, a couple of friends, and we were just chopping it up a little bit. And I had this friend named Lee. And unfortunately, Lee passed away recently, but he was uh, somebody who was into the podcast space previously. And he was like, you know what? You should just start a podcast and see what happens. And I didn't really take him serious at first. I was like, you know what? I don't have time for that. I'm busy. I have a job. I have work, this, that, the other thing. And everything just started to change for me after I left my corporate job. I left my corporate job with plans to travel the world, go on hikes, climb mountains, but instead I met my girlfriend. So changed everything for me. So I decided that I was gonna stay locally and I was gonna switch things up. But before I was able to jump into a new career, my girlfriend was diagnosed with stage 2B breast cancer. So we obviously geared up for a battle. And it was a very long, arduous uh, process. It was difficult, but it balanced me. And it it made me have the ability to think a little bit more clearly about what I wanted to do. And she was the one who pushed me towards starting my podcast. And I started my podcast. One day I said to myself, you know what? This Epstein story is absolutely insane. This is going to be the story that I talk about. And there was elements of it from my life the FBI, the corruption angle, people in my life getting railroaded by the FBI, and it all just came together. So I had two cell phones to start, Nick, okay? I had one cell phone that I was reading from and the other one that I was recording into. And it all just blew up from there. And as as you know, I'm not very big on social media. I'm not somebody who goes and, you know, promotes my work, nothing like that. Everything's just been organic for me. And this is, for me, it's the same, This is what I'm doing on my podcast is the same thing I'd be doing in the backyard with my family and my friends talking about the same stuff. So it all just was organic for me to make the switch. And it's all just snowballed since then. Well, you started a podcast called the Epstein Chronicles. That was yeah, well, my, my, my first podcast was the Jeffrey Epstein show. And it was highly, 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 highly taken down by, you know, the powers that be. It was completely shadow banned. It was completely blocked. It was completely just garbage, basically. And I, at that point, I had built that podcast up to over a million views, a million downloads. So it was, you know, pretty disheartening, but I'm not the kind of person that just gives up. I'm pretty stubborn. And I don't just, you know, take my L's and just crawl back into my hole. I'm the kind of guy that comes out swinging, you know, bite down on the mouthpiece, meet you in the middle of the ring and let's go. So now at that point, I was frustrated and I was not going to be told no. So I started the Epstein Chronicles about two and a half years ago, right before the Glenn Maxwell trial. And once I started that podcast with the Glenn Maxwell trial and all of the momentum that we had built on the other podcast, thankfully, for whatever reason, it caught in the algorithm. And people were able to get the podcast by just searching in Apple. And tell us about the Epstein Chronicles. What what did you focus on the most? See, for me, it started when I was just getting started. It was about corruption in the FBI and how this all could have even happened in the first place. How was this man allowed to do this? How did the FBI miss it? 
How did they ignore what people like Maria Farmer and Annie Farmer were telling them? How did they ignore what they were seeing, obviously? So from there, I said to myself, well, if the FBI is kicking in the door and arresting people that I love for illegal gambling, why in the hell weren't they arresting this man as well? So that started me down a rabbit hole of looking at the court documents, diving into everything that I could possibly find when it came to what survivors and people who were eyewitnesses had to say. And what I what I learned by doing that is that the FBI obviously knew exactly what was going on. They didn't care what was going on. And still to this day, they don't care what's going on. It's interesting. I wrote a book called The Franklin Scandal, a story of power brokers, child abuse and betrayal. And it was the FBI that really carried the water for the cover up in Omaha, the, the pedophile network, the epicenter was in Omaha. And a lot of the kids were flown to Washington, D.C., and it was the Secret Service that perpetrated most of the cover up in Washington, D.C. So I became and I, I stumbled across that story about 21 years ago. And I was very skeptical of it until I visited Omaha. And then I realized that it was real and it was much bigger and uglier than I thought. Yeah, and it's kind of an eye-opening experience when that happens, right? It, it was the same for me. When you find out that this is really real and it's not some conspiracy. It was, uh, I, it was you know, it altered the trajectory of my life. I, I just said, I'm not going to let these bastards get away with this. And I, it was man against the machine. But I, I, I was so enraged initially that all these children were destroyed with impunity. And then I kind of had to scale back the anger or else I was going to make mistakes. How was your emotional process with the Epstein Chronicles or, or just the Epstein story? I thrive on anger. I'm a lot like Bobby Axelrod from the show Billions. You know, I'm a carnivorous fucking monster. And my <laughs> anger... My anger, it really drives me. I've always been somebody that was able to harness his anger, but not emotion. I try not to be run on emotion ever. So my anger fuels me to keep going and not get burned out, to not decide to say, oh, you know what? This isn't going anywhere. I should just give up. So I stay angry, but I, I keep my anger directed where it should be. And the real anger for me anyway, when it comes to this whole entire ordeal, are the people that are in power. And when you really go and you look at the people that are truly in power, not just with this, but in everything, it's the financial sector. And there's not even a debate about it. These are the men that are funding all this bullshit. They're the ones that are facilitating all this bullshit. And they're the ones that are snatching everybody's dreams with their 31% interest rates. What I find amazing is that the congressional approval rating now is uh, 17%. So 83% of Americans don't think that the government is acting in their best interest. And I agree with that 100%. And what's really interesting, last month, uh, Tennessee Representative Tim Boucher came out and said that his colleagues were getting blackmailed. And I've been screaming that from the rooftops for 21 years. And finally, a federal representative came out and said that. It was it was. It, it was kind of like a peak experience for me. It was so, uh, it, it just validated everything that I've been saying. Yeah, you know, the, the, the big issue that I've seen is there's a lot of people out there that don't want this information to get out, that want to play gatekeeper, that don't want to have the other side, if you will, score political points. And instead of just exposing it for what it is and calling people out for what they are, they choose to look the other way. They choose to attack people in a different manner and make people fight amongst themselves as opposed to rallying people around an issue as serious as this. And the crazy thing about Congress and the Senate that people don't even realize is there's a hush fund that the Congress and Senate has set up that gets American tax dollars that they use to pay for all of their harassment charges, all of their bullying charges, and it's paid out more than $18 million already. And that's my money and your money. I'm not familiar with that. Where, where did you come across that information? I mean, it doesn't surprise me, but I'm just not familiar with it. 
Yeah, it's it's uh, it's highly sourced. You can find it on CNN. CNN ran an article on it in 2018. I did an episode on it before. Um, so it's this hush fund, and they have access to get money from it, draw funds from it, and then they're able to use those funds to pay accusers, to pay people that they've bullied in their office, and then the people have to sign NDAs like usual, you know, because the power imbalance. So they'll sign the NDA and they'll use my money and your money to pay these people off and then get on their ivory tower and yap about whatever the hell they're going to yap about. It's interesting. You befriended a number of the victims and I've talked to a number of the victims. And one thing that's lost in translation with the mainstream media is that Epstein and Maxwell were vicious to these girls. Vicious. And the mainstream media just doesn't report on that. Yeah, they they were, and it wasn't even just physical. The the mental viciousness yes. that occurred here, it was just out of control. And I have heard from, I can't even tell you how many women I have heard from, Nick, throughout this whole entire thing, women that haven't even come forward, that have contacted me and talked to me about their experiences. And I have been completely and utterly changed by what I have heard. I'm not somebody that's a believe all women guy. I believe evidence. I believe the evidence wherever it leads me. So I came into this with, always with the idea that maybe there were people playing games and people were trying to get a payday. But that's, this is so much further away from that than I could have ever possibly imagined that it is so disturbing to think that there are people amongst us that could do what these people were doing. And they're in positions of power. And that's the thing too, positions of power. And they get to these positions, they weasel their way in. And then once they're there, well, what happens? There's no term limits. So once they have their hold on power, most of these people who are really entrenched, they're not gonna go anywhere ever until they decide they wanna go or until they die. I've always uh, known that there's a, a substantial number of our federal representatives are compromised. I think that and I know of cases where representatives are compromised and it's helped their career. Um, I think Dennis Hastert is one of them. He had been a pedophile going back 40 years and he had a meteoric rise in the House of Representatives and became the speaker. He was the Speaker of the House for seven years. And I think he's one of the Republicans. He's one of the few Republicans that have held that position for seven years. And that is a case of someone who is compromised and it helped their career. And when you talked about Maxwell and Epstein and you realized how vicious they were, th that must have galvanized your anger. Yeah, you know, I've always been the kind of person that despises a bully. Ever since I was young, I don't like bullies. I don't like people that I always punch up. I never punch down. I've never been that kind of person. I was raised like that. So for me, when I started to see what was going on, I saw the way they were vicious. And then what really set me over the edge is when I learned what happened during the first grand jury proceeding in Palm Beach. When they attacked that poor little girl, not only did Jeffrey Epstein's lawyers attack her, but the prosecutors, Kersher, and the rest of the scumbags down there in Palm Beach, they destroyed this poor little girl too. And for some, for something as that we've all done, how many of us, when we were teenagers, we're drinking some beers or having a cigarette or kissing a boy or a girl. I know I was. I was wilding out when I was that age. But they use that. The prosecutors use that against their own witness. Well, what's even more egregious is that law enforcement knew of 23 victims at that point. And Barry Kirshner, the special prosecutor of that grand jury, only called one of one, those one girl. Yep. And, and destroyed and skewered her. her. And yep. skewered her. Yep. And that was that was what really that was what I, I would call it my launched into orbit moment when I really found out the the lengths that these people would go to get somebody like this guy off. I was and don't get me wrong, I'm not one of these people that's really mad at Epstein's lawyers. I, I think they're scumbags and I think they're dirt bags but that's their job right it's the prosecutor's job to make sure this shit doesn't happen and the prosecutor's job isn't to play nice with these dudes go to dinner with them lunch with them play golf your job is to put that motherfucker in prison for the rest of his life and you failed there's 
many, many perpetrators in the Epstein network. He pandered children for 25 years. There's multiple people that should be in prison, and those procurers should be in prison. Those procurers are, were essentially pimps, although Epstein and Maxwell were the premier pimps, but there were a number of pimps below them. And when the law gets that corrupted, where the government is covering up child abuse, it's it, it really shows how perfidious the world is that we live in. Yeah. And, you know, it's they had all the tools they needed in the toolbox to get all of these people wrapped up in one case. They could have hit them with RICO charges. And if they hit them with RICO charges, which are federal charges that were created to take down organized crime, it would have been a wrap. Everybody who got one single dollar from them would have been caught up in it because they would have had to figure out if those were ill gotten gains or not. So if you get one dollar for somebody that's under RICO investigation, you're now part of that investigation if the feds want to pursue it that way. So they avoided RICO for Jeffrey Epstein. They avoided it for Glenn Maxwell. They avoided it for this whole organization. But R. Kelly gets RICO'd. Nexium gets RICO'd. Young Thug gets RICO'd. And with RICO, it's the procurers. It would be a slam dunk with RICO. The procurers, uh, uh, child trafficking is 15 years to life. Yes. And you, you would get those procurers who the New York Times named seven of them. Maxwell included, you would get those procurers and you would nail them on multiple counts of child trafficking where they'd be looking at a thousand years and they'd roll over on the perps in a heartbeat. It would and be a simple RICO. It'd be one of the most straightforward RICO cases of all time. And that's what I've been saying forever. The way I explain it to people is if you want to look at the Epstein's organization correctly, Epstein was the boss. Glenn Maxwell was the underboss. Then you had his core four, Sarah Kellen Vickers, Adriana Ross, you had um, uh, Leslie Groff and you had Nadia Marcinkova, but Nadia is kind of iffy because she was sold to him at 15 years old. But if you want to look at it like a mafia structure, you have the boss, the underboss, then you have the capo regimes. So you have the cat and that's how you, uh, you would go after it. You go after the capos, you have them roll on the underboss, then the underboss rolls on the boss. But they didn't do anything like that. They were protecting blackmailed pedophiles. When did you come up with the idea that blackmail was involved in this? Oh, very early on. Once I found out that there were all of these famous people going to islands and I found out the place was wired. Look, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to put two and two together. If, you, if you're a rich guy and you have all these underage girls at your house and there's a bunch of fornication taking place, or should we call it what it is, rape, then what you have, what you have is a treasure trove of blackmail material, if that's what you're looking for. We all know that you can get away with these days. If you cheat on your wife, you can talk your way out of that. You can't talk your way out of being with a child. Most people in society are not going to be okay with it. Now, the people that are running the country obviously are okay with it, but most of us, the regular people, that's where we draw the line. Well, what's interesting about that is we would never trust someone who is trafficking children. And we would never trust anyone who is covering up the trafficking of children. But yet it, our government is covering up the trafficking of children. How can we trust our government when it's committing such an egregious sin? And you know, it's so crazy. It's all of these people that want to tell us that they're the movers and the shakers of the world. They're the powerful people in finance. They're the great politicians of the world. But we had no idea what Epstein was up to. Oh, we have no idea that he was, you know, diddling kids. We have no idea that he was raping little girls. We have no idea. But he was already prosecuted. What do you mean you have no idea? How, do, how does the CIA director have no idea who Jeffrey Epstein is? Can somebody please explain this to me? Considering that they spent uh, some time together. <laughs> I, that, that's it's the funniest shit in the whole world to me. And then the whole entire coverage of that part of it. Like, let's just forget about that. Let's not talk about Bill Clinton going to the White House 17 times. I mean, I mean, Jeffrey Epstein going to Clinton's White House 17 times. Let's just forget about that. Let's talk about Alex Acosta some more. Well, he was the U.S. attorney that was told to stand down because Epstein was intelligence. And as I've said on this podcast a number of times, there's only two people in the government that can tell a U.S. attorney to stand down. One is the president. One is the attorney general. That can be the message can be delivered by a minion of the president or the attorney general. So that's the kind of power that Epstein was tapped into. Yeah, it was Mukasey. For the cover up. 
Yeah, Mukasey was the acting attorney general at the time, and they were all buddies from there, you know, Dershowitz and all these guys from their connections in Harvard and all these other societies that these weirdos are part of. So what they do is they'll meet up on the golf course, and that's how they decide fate. It's not done in the courtroom. They make these deals and the backroom deals. Mukasey signs off on it, and Acosta becomes the fall guy. And that's all Acosta ever was. Now, don't get me wrong. Scumbag, he should have had some backbone. He should have said, no, this guy's going to prison. And if you want to fire me for it, fire me for it. He didn't do that. So he got what he deserved. In this case, we see so many people, and I saw it in the Franklin scandal too, people just aren't doing their jobs. I mean, that's how, uh, there, there's that uh, quote by Edmund Burke, or attributed to Edmund Burke, um, evil flourishes when good men do nothing. And we saw a lot of ostensibly good people do nothing that were in positions of power to do something. Yeah. And it was, it was pervasive. It wasn't one or two people. It was multiple people throughout this whole entire time. We're talking about how many different presidencies now going back to at least Clinton. So all the way through, everybody had a chance to stop him. Everybody knew who he was, especially after 2007, 2008. So I don't want to hear the bullshit. We had no idea who he was. Oh, it was solicitation. First of all, let's get something straight, okay? Solicitation? You were asking a little girl to come have sex with you. There should be no such thing as solicitation of a minor. That's child abuse. That's picking up a child, whatever you want to call it. But it's not solicitation. Solicitation is me or you at the bar picking up an escort when we're drunk. That's solicitation. Not picking up a child. And that's what they tried to sell it as. That's what they tried to pitch it as. And the New York State Attorney General tried to get Jeffrey Epstein's registration knocked down to the very bottom level so that he was looked at as not a, a dangerous offender. This is what they, Cy Vance's ar office, argued in court. Cy Vance is plugged into a very powerful family. His father was actually the, uh, I think, foreign secretary or not... Defense Secretary. Was it Defense Secretary for uh, Carter? Cyrus I'm, not too, I'm not too sure, but it doesn't shock me. To be honest with you, the way all these people, their nepotism and their connections, and it's almost like we have this ruling class where one of them dies and their son creeps in another a couple of years later to take over their job. With what we have now is we have for lack of a better word, a pedocracy. Um, and we know that Epstein trafficked these little girls and was vicious to them for, for 25 years. And what were your thoughts when Epstein got arrested the second time? Did you think that finally some justice is going to occur? Well, I was pretty hesitant to get on the wagon of we're going to get justice finally this time. But I thought that it was a, a step in the right direction. That's for damn sure. After no action for all these years, finally a step in the right direction. But, you know, the thing that people don't point out, and I always say the quiet stuff because I just don't care, this wouldn't have even happened. They wouldn't have launched this investigation if Acosta wasn't who he was and working where he was working at the time. This was all about Trump. That's what this all started out as for the Miami Herald. Oh, this was about trying to slam Trump. So they went after Acosta thinking they could tie that. But what they really found was a whole ass ball of wax they weren't expecting. So that's how that whole all started for the, the, the Miami Herald. It wasn't altruistic. They, were, they had all these years to go after Epstein. All of a sudden, it's a coincidence. Acosta gets that job and they're going after him. So, you know, it, 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 it all dovetails together. It's amazing that this is being made into a political issue. Marsha Blackburn, the senator, wanted the flight manifest of Epstein's, and the Senate Judiciary Committee blocked her from getting the flight manifests. Now, I think that she did that because the Democrats were going after Clarence Thomas and some other conservative Supreme Court judges. And ultimately, this thing became a political and it shouldn't be political. It just, it should be, you don't molest children with impunity. It's, it's a, it's very simple. And now it's, it's politics are involved when, when politics should definitely not be involved. Yeah. This is an issue that should transcend politics. And when you have rep representatives on the house floor, holding up pictures of Epstein with presidents, making a mockery of what these survivors went through, it's not a good look. It is not a good look. And I really don't, 
dive into the political realm too often because I don't want it to get in the way of my work. But sometimes you have to call the balls and strikes for what they are. And trying to politicize this is a bunch of bullshit. And there's a lot of people on the left that were calling for accountability for a very long time who are not holding people accountable. They're not holding Stacey Plaskett accountable. They're not holding anybody in the USVI accountable. They're certainly not holding Bill Clinton accountable. So at what point do we have to call out their hypocrisy for what it is? I think that we need to call out their hypocrisy. Uh, and I started an organization called Epstein Justice, which you know about. And w Americans, I mean, most Americans know that something really stinks with Epstein. I don't think they know how putrid it is. But I think that the the message of Epstein Justice is a relatively simple message. We want the perpetrators who molested these girls indicted, and we want to know why the government covered up a child molestation ring, a child trafficking ring. It's it's really simple. What, what we want is two basic things. It's going to be a battle to get there, but grassroots movements have have changed workers' rights, have changed civil rights, have changed uh, women's rights. These all started out as grassroots movements. We need a movement for children's rights at this point, and especially this; these types of crimes need to be punished. They do not; they should not be covered up. Yeah, these these are the sorts of crimes. See, I'm not a mandatory sentence kind of guy. I think each crime is unique and should be looked at as a unique situation when we're talking about most crimes. When we're talking about molesting children, we're talking about rape. You're a violent, sick fuck, and you need to be put away. And it needs to be mandatory mandatory time for people that do this. And as you and I are talking now, there are, I'm pretty sure that there are pedophile networks pandering children to powerful people as, as we speak. Yeah, you know, it's unfortunate that most people don't want to realize what's really going on. It's much easier to just make pretend that it's all some big conspiracy theory. Oh, this person's crazy or that person's crazy. Oh, Rachel Maddow didn't talk about it. So it's easy for people to put their head in the sand and act like it's not going on. But the reality is there's people on the front lines of this shit, namely the survivors who are out there putting themselves in great harm. I mean, we're talking about people who have spent years trying to be anonymous and then to come out and have this whole entire avalanche of interest, people calling them, trying to contact them, get them on their shows, the whole thing. So for me, my, 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 my theory had always been throughout this whole thing. I never contacted any of those survivors. They all contacted me because there's just too much going on for them. And you look at the way that it's been handled, and these are the ones, these are the people who are on the front lines with people like me and you, but these are the ones that are out there. They're the vanguard, right? We're coming up from the rear trying to give them support. But these are the real true heroes of this story, in my opinion, and the, the girls that haven't come forward. Let me tell you, the struggle that a lot of these women are going through, Nick, it's unconscionable, unconscionable. What I find utterly unconscionable is the way that the media has covered this up with the government. I have not seen anyone in the mainstream media, the major mainstream media, call for justice for these victims. I, I've not seen one. Yeah, there, no, there's really not that call. A lot of a lot of times when you hear this talked about in the legacy media, it's used to score points one way or the other. It's either, oh, Donald Trump was with. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein or so and so was with Jeffrey Epstein or this one's being having their blood drank on this island. You know how it goes. People are throwing all kinds of wild shit out there, but they need to understand. And I think people really should just focus on the fact that what we're talking about here affects real people. These aren't just names on a page. These aren't names to be used as a political cudgel. These are people who have lives and dreams and hopes that were crushed by some sick, disgusting fuckbags. They don't need to be used as political pawns by a bunch of people trying to score political points. What I find amazing is the media's will dig up salacious dirt. It's more than happy to manufacture salacious dirt. But when it comes to manufacturing a call for justice, there's no one out there that's calling for justice. 
I was going to be on CNN uh, about three weeks ago when that when there was that document dump that was uh, released. And I was texting. I actually wrote a blog about it on my website. I was texting with the producer. And I said, I really would like to talk about Epstein justice, too. Not only I was the guy that put the black book on the Internet. So with these latest tranche of documents, they thought that I would be a good guy to interview. And I'm having the, the, this texting session with the producer. And I said, I'd really like to talk about uh, Epstein justice. And then the last text I got from him is we're going a different direction. <laughs> so Yeah, they love to do that with Epstein stuff. And what has your experience with the media been? The only interview that I've accepted was with Tucker Carlson. Besides that, I've told them all to get stuffed. They've never done anything for me. And honestly, they haven't really done anything for this story. Now, there's a few good journalists out there who have covered this story, but the legacy media itself don't just show up when there's, you know, money to be made because it's a hot story right now. It's trending on Twitter. Either be in the fight or don't be in the fight. I have no problem talking to you, sitting down with you and chopping it up for however long. But when it comes to these legacy media organizations, I have no use for them. I never have, and I never will. Well, the legacy media is run by ethical eunuchs. I mean, if they're not going to take on this issue, which is so blatant and in, in, in our face, they obviously do not have, I believe, a, a moral barometer. That That's my thing. I think there are reporters that do have moral barometers, but I think the people at the apex of power in those media organizations have made Faustian packs and for whatever reason, and their moral barometers are severely lacking. Yeah, once they get a taste of that power, that money, they don't want to they don't want to, you know, give that back. They don't want to recede from where they're at. And they feel like, well, I don't care if this story is affecting somebody else. Let's talk about, you know, insert stupid. Let's get the people fired up topic here. A topic that really in the grand scheme of things doesn't really mean anything to us. It, it, it matters little. It'll be forgotten by tomorrow. But they know that they can get people fired up for a few days of news until the next a lead that bleed shows up. Meanwhile, there's actual real stories with consequence out there that they've just ignored and for decades. These victims that you've talked to and I've talked to, and I've talked to victims that weren't in the Epstein network, and they are uh, they are tormented. And once you are in a network like that and and Epstein and Maxwell were vicious and we talked about the mind games that they played. These victims just aren't going to be able to turn the page and start a new life. They're scarred. They're, they're severely scarred. Probably for life. And yeah, there's no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. That's a life change, a life altering issue. Something like that happens to you. And, you know, all of a sudden, before you know it, that whole world comes crashing down and you realize everything that was normalized to you, that is not how life is. That is not how it's supposed to be. And you were being abused. I mean, think about Nadia Marcinkova. We're talking about a 15-year-old girl who was sold to Jeffrey Epstein by John Luke Brunel. And then this girl was re reared up to basically be his assistant. But how much, how can, how, how can you really hold her responsible if she's 15 years old and she's groomed basically her whole life? It's such a, 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 a crazy situation, especially with Nadia, that it's almost hard to even digest what happened to that poor girl. And then, of course, abuse people, abuse people. Right. She was part of his his grooming process. She grew up in his clutches. And before you know it, she's out here committing the abuse with them. Yeah, I, I it's kind of difficult to know where. Mar Nadia Marcinkova fits into this because she was sold to Jeffrey Epstein and she was uh, basically reared by him. Yeah, it's a moral and, dilemma for me. What's that? It's a moral dilemma for me. Uh, yeah, you know, me, too. To me too. Like that because I understand the, you know, people don't understand the, the grooming process for the most part. They hear about it, you know, TikTok or whatever, but they don't understand the actual real grooming process and what it does to somebody. 
you're basically being brainwashed and your whole entire mind is being reshifted and refocused. And that's one thing that uh, these perps, a lot of the girls were given money to go out and find other girls. So basically they're brought into this conspiracy. And, and I'm not talking about the main ones. I'm just talking about Epstein's victims. Yeah, the high school girls. That was yes. part of it. That was the Ponzi scheme. And that was his yes. shield. People don't talk about this either. That was his shield. So when he got caught, he could say to the authorities, well, they were prostitutes. I paid them. What are you talking about? There was We were trading services. I was rendering a service from a prostitute. And that was part of his cover up. And the media has sanitized it. The media really hasn't gotten into how vicious and Maxwell and Epstein were. It hasn't hasn't really touched that. But there's another element to this story. I know two therapists, and one's an eminent therapist, and both have had um, uh, for clients Epstein victims that were, and and these kids were molested when they were under ten years old. And I know of at least one Epstein victim that was molested when she was 13. So the mainstream media hasn't touched that at all. And actually, there's there's articles out there that some of those girls were 11 or 12 from a main, somewhat a mainstream media publication in Australia. So that's another way that this has been sanitized is that these girls were younger than 14. The media and the government have settled on 14 years, but they were younger. Have, have you heard about girls younger than 14? Yeah, I mean, I've heard, the youngest I've heard about is 10 years old. I've heard 10 years old all the way up to women in their 20s, late 20s, early 30s. And I'm, I'm sure there, there's even more. I am 100% I am sure that there's more that we have no idea about. Women who probably have passed away from drug addiction, women who have passed away from their life being so screwed up. They've made bad life choices in the after the aftermath of all of this. And it led to disaster for them. They had no resources, no help, nobody there to, you know, have shoulder to cry on. So there are so many victims, unnamed victims in this disgusting operation that it's almost hard to quantify it because we know of hundreds. If you know of hundreds, well. You don't again, you don't have to take too big of a leap here to understand what's going on. You don't have to be a statistician to understand. With these girls that are under 10, people would say, well, that can't be true. But Epstein was a psychopath and he was providing a service. And and I saw this with the Franklin scandal. If someone wanted a 10 year old these psychopaths will provide them with a 10 year old. It, it's not like they have the pangs of conscience. No, it's it for, for him, for Epstein, it was all about continuing to build that compromise and whatever, whatever he vehicle he had to use to get there, he was going to use that vehicle. Nothing mattered. It was all about power. It was all about place. These people that we're talking about, they don't get off the way you and I do. Me and you go to the casino. We put in a hundred dollar bet. We're having a good old time. These people have to do all kinds of disgusting, devious shit because they're on a whole different level than we are with their fucking weird society that they're part of. And I know that sounds crazy. And I'm not talking about, you know, people running around in masks and doing weird dances. I'm talking about the elite of the elite financially. They have a whole different way of living than we do. And they look at us like pieces on a chessboard. And if you don't believe that, just take a look at all the wars around the world that they love to shove us in and make your children go and eat that war. It's never their kids, right? Our elite have really let down Americans. And as I said earlier, the congressional approval rating is 17%. So 83% of Americans don't think that the government is acting in their best interest. And I think it's important to mobilize people. People know that something is seriously wrong with our government. And they know that there was something with Epstein really stinks. What we have to do is show people that there's a direct correlation between how Congress acts and the Epstein case, that a number of our politicians are compromised. And I know Americans are going to experience cognitive dissonance over that. 
I went, when I was pitching the Franklin scandal and then when I was pitching Epstein, um, I had fewer people to pitch Epstein to because I pitched the Franklin scandal to people. And I was, I'd, I'd either be talking to an editor or a publisher. And I would, I had a lot, I had like a list of victims. I, I had all kinds of um, documentation and I would show it to them. And I could, I would look into their eyes and I could see the cognitive dissonance happening right before my very eyes. They thought, well, this is a horrible story and we need to help Nick Bryant out or Nick Bryant is crazy and I can go home to my family tonight and have a nice dinner and not have to worry about this. That's what I encountered with the mainstream media when I was trying to pitch Franklin and, and then Epstein. I had Epstein's black book in 2012 and I couldn't get a publication to go with it until 2015. And then after it's published, every major media has talked about the black book. Tons of ink have been spilt on the black book, but only one publication has given me credit for the black book. <laughs> it's, you know, the, the legacy media is such a monkey see monkey do type of deal. They'll wait for somebody to have the courage to break a story, and then they'll piggyback off of that story being broke. And that's just another reason I don't feed into their machine. I have no desire to feed their machine. I have no desire to be part of it. And I just don't want to be associated with any of those networks. I just don't. Fox, MSNBC, CNN, OAN, all those networks are doing the same exact thing. They're trying to get the pitchforks and the torches to fight each other when we should all be focused on the man in the high castle. Some people actually consider me a radical because I don't think children should be molested with impunity. It's it, it's kind of strange. And um, there's a George Orwell quote uh, during times of universal deceit telling the truth becomes a radical act. And we've been trying to tell the truth. And consequently, we are branded as radicals. Yeah, they like just to for trying to tell the truth. They like to throw those labels around, but it's funny to me because, you know, you see people out here, they're out here rallying for whatever the fuck their cause is, Palestine, this, that, the other thing. But those people, that's all fine and well. They're, you're not a radical. You're not a terrorist. You're not this. You're not that. But a guy has a couple of ideas and all of a sudden the guy's bank account's gone. The guy can't get credit or, you know, whatever some of these people have went through, all because they might have an idea that goes against the mainstream. And it just shows you how dangerous ideas are. Ideas are always more dangerous than acting the fool in the street because ideas, well, they can catch fire. And if the idea is good, you better believe people are going to take note. I have uh, had my fair share of harassment over the years. And uh, I was, have you have you been experiencing any harassment? Not one single bit. Oh, Not really? Okay. Bit. No, like... I don't know if it's the way I come off on my podcast because I'm not the kind of person that's going to let someone harass me. Like if you, especially in real life, like on the internet, you couldn't harass me because I don't give a shit about the internet. I don't go on social media, so I don't give a fuck. But in real life, somebody ever shows up talking shit to me or you better be ready to fight. I'm from the street. I'm not going to sit here and I'm not, uh, what's his name that was following around the Harvey Weinstein, whatever that cat's name was, that reporter dude who got all scared. Oh, the guy who broke the Weinstein story. Oh, they're following me. Yeah, right. I'm going to take you into a neighborhood you don't want to be in. And then we're going to see how tough you are. Well, that's that New York City coming out in you. You were, you were born and raised in New York City, right? Yeah, I was born in the South Bronx. I know a couple of guys that were born in the South Bronx who are very tough guys. You know, for me, it's just I'm not going to play those games. Like if I feel like my safety especially is being jeopardized, we're going to have a big conversation about it. I'm going to stop my car in the middle of traffic and I might extract you from yours. It just all depends on the feeling I'm feeling at that point. But for the most part, I'm just a, a, I'm a very peaceful man. Like I don't believe in war. I don't want to fight with nobody. But when it comes to defending myself or things I believe in, I will stand up for what I believe in and I will not I won't be pushed off my perch. When I was investigating the Franklin scandal, as I've said on this podcast before, I did have a death threat. And um, what I came across was so horrific and so malevolent that I just, I couldn't stop myself. I had to keep pursuing it. And, yeah. And then with Epstein, I started digging into Epstein 
around 2011, and then I made my first Florida sojourn in, in 2012. And I came back with a cache of stuff, including the Black Book. And I really felt it, as, and I went to these various publishers and I said that there is a network going on here because the Black Book had a number of, of Epstein's uh, victims in it. And I called a number, I wanted to talk to these victims first before I came back and tried to pitch this. And I talked to these victims in the Black Book and they told me about being on planes and being flown to the island. And then at that point, I knew that I was dealing with a network uh, that was very much like the network that I wrote about. And that's just something people don't want to hear. They, they're, they're, they're all right with child molesters being in trailer parks. But with child molesters making our laws, uh, actually uh, part of our judiciary, People don't want to. People don't want to hear about that, even though they don't think very highly of our congressional people. Well, you know, the uh, air conditioning in the bunker is just too nice to leave, right? I mean, when you when you detach from the group, think it's pretty difficult to start thinking for yourself. It's you know, it's a difficult process for a lot of people to disconnect from from the teat, if you will, of the legacy media. You know, they get, I know people that sit there and they suck up what they hear on the leg in the, on TV, like all day, they'll sit in front of that TV, eight, 10 hours watching, you know, Fox news or CNN, and then think they actually have an idea about what's going on in the world. And I'm like, you are suffering from Dunning Kruger syndrome. Like it's nobody's business. You know, what's really interesting about that is the majority of Americans don't trust the mainstream media, but yet they believe it. I mean, that's what that, that's what I find mind boggling. I think a lot of it is people want to have their bias stroked, right? People want to say, oh, see, people think like me. I'm not crazy. These people think like I do. Everybody thinks like this. Every people want to think like that. The mainstream people, people that haven't, you know, blown out of the box yet. People that don't understand that there's a vast, vast world out there that is not encompassed on that TV. Well, I see with the media just creating a divide and conquer the people on the left look at the people on the right as QAnon types even even though QAnon is is a relatively small percentage of the people on the right so the people on the left think that the people on the right have lost their minds and then people on the right look at woke which is a relatively small percentage of the left as losing their minds so we the the media has nourished, and this has been going on, I think, probably since since Reagan, the Reagan administration, is to stoke the antipathy between the right and the left. And then, if something bad happens, if you're on the left, you think it's the politicians on the right, or if you're on the right, you think it's the politicians on the left. It's 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 quite an elegant system. Oh yeah, they got their baked in boogeyman, right? They have their baked in boogeyman, no matter what happens. And the real the, the craziest part about that is the craziest part about it is when Americans finally figure it out, hopefully someday, that this is all by design. All this red meat that's being thrown to you on these on these stations to get you fired up. It's all by design. There's real issues out here that we should be tackling together. But instead, we're at loggerheads over dumb shit that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. You looked at our website epstein justice i did we really want to get justice we want accountability we, we want a truth and reconciliation commission and we there's two simple things that we want we want accountability for the perpetrators and we want accountability for the government why has the government covered up child sex trafficking and well I'll tell i think that that it, it, the message is simple enough it just needs to be rehashed and rehashed and rehashed. Yeah, I think that it's like anything else. Repetition, right? Repet a repetitive nature, a message, you say a message enough times, people start paying attention. And I think that the, the problem that people run into, like you and I, when we're trying to explain this story to people, is you have a lot of resistance in the legacy media that don't want to see this for what it is, as you've pointed out. 
They want to look at it as just, you know, this little issue, maybe one or two girls, oh, that no big deal. He was arrested. It's all over and done with. But we know it goes deeper than that. When you have guys like Leon Black, Ehud Barak, when you have guys like Bill Clinton, when you have all these different people that are walking in the same atmosphere as this man, and not just that, but breaking bread with them, spending time with them, going to hotels with them, and in Bill Clinton's instance, getting a massage from one of the survivors in an airport. I mean, I don't know about you, Nick, but I don't know one person who has molested children. Never mind the whole fucking glut like Bill Clinton does. The uh, Epstein Victims Compensation Fund, I, I think, is a superlative cover-up tool because if, if you make, if you get a, a settlement from that fund, you cannot sue any of your other perpetrators. You, you've given up your right to sue your perpetrators. I call that the no deposition fund. The whole entire idea yes. was to avoid depositions. And only 225 women have come forward. 75 have been denied. Uh, two of them were, I believe, two of the, that I know of were under 10 when or their therapists certainly believe that they were under 10 when they were molested by Epstein at all. So we've got this Epstein Victims Compensation Fund that's an amazing tool. And only 225 girls and women have come forward. There's, as you said earlier, there's hundreds out there. Why, why do you think more didn't come forward? I think a lot of these women thought they wouldn't be believed. I think a lot of these women thought that it would be a process. They don't want to put their families through it. A lot of them are married now. They have children. They've tried to forget about it, even though they can't. They've tried to forget about it. And for them, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, even though they could have made a, you know, a million bucks, couple hundred thousand, whatever it might have been. To them, it wasn't worth it. And that 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 right there goes into the face of people who say, oh, it's a money grab. This is not what this is. Don't get me wrong. There are situations that are money grabs where there's people out there that are making up fucking stories to try and get paid. This is not it. This right here is not it. The reason why I wanted you on my podcast is because you have such an in-depth knowledge of it, like I do. And we've both been swimming in the same in that sewer for quite some time. And, yeah. uh, and, and very few people can take that kind of exposure. No, you're sewer. right. P people really don't want to, um, you know, swim in that kind of water. But for me, I look at it like if I if not me, then who? Right. Sometimes I'm, I, I'm not exactly what you would call. Oh, oh, an, an activist for women's rights. I'm, a, I'm like a brute. You know what I mean? I'm like a, a jock. I'm into sports. I have a disgusting mouth, but I draw the line at hurting people. And I certainly draw the line at hurting children. So I, nobody else was speaking up. So I figured, you know what? I guess it's time for me and my big mouth to show up. And I came to the same conclusion. Once I realized that Epstein was a network trafficking children, I, I couldn't let it go. I yep. mean, the Franklin scandal had taken a lot out of me. And, but once I realized that Epstein was a network, I, I realized that I had to go at it again. And um, that this type of malevolent behavior by our government has to stop. Some battles are worth fighting, right? And this is one of them. This is definitely one of them. Bobby, have yourself a great night. 